Okay, so, in this uh, lecture, I am going to discuss uh, a new topic, which is uh, the Schrieffer Wolf transformation. So, if you remember in the last class, I had stopped at this stage, where I uh, pointed out that you can introduce uh, certain operators called order parameters, uh, whose uh, non-zero non-vanishing expectation value signifies the existence of various interesting phases. So, the next uh, topic which will conclude this chapter will be the uh, topic which explains to us uh, how to uh, transform this uh, Hubbard model that we had encountered into a model that describes magnetism. So, you see magnetism is a kind of mystery especially ferromagnetism if you think about it. Uh, the fundamental uh, basis for why there is ferromagnetism. After all, if you imagine uh, what ferromagnetism is, uh, it is basically a situation where uh, you know you apply uh, a magnetic field, the uh, material is magnetized that is easy to understand, but then if you remove the magnetic field, the magnetization does not go away. So, that is somewhat perplexing. So, it calls out for a fundamental explanation in terms of the behavior of the fundamental constituents of the substance. So, that is uh, something very not very obvious how to do that. So, in fact, uh, the way to do that is to invoke uh, this type of an approach, where we point out that uh, if you start with this tight binding picture of electrons in a solid there is a natural sense in which uh, a magnetic insulator is obtained from that description. See after all the Hubbard model includes uh, very uh, essentially uh, two aspects. One aspect is the hopping the kinetic term. So, the electrons hop from one side to the other. So, that describes the conduction process or the bonding or whatever. So, whereas, the other uh, aspect is uh, the on site coulomb repulsion. So, that is also there. So, there are two competing processes one process is the hopping the other process is the on site repulsion. So, the uh, ground state of the system is uh, obtained by some kind of a compromise between these two competing processes. So, now let us imagine a situation where you have precisely one electron per site. So, that is not uncommon you might think that that might be very unusual and uh, remarkable situation to have exactly one electron per site, but that is not in fact, it is very common because uh, you can have a situation where uh, exactly one electron uh, an atom contributes one electron to the conduction process. So, as a result you can uh, you know the, uh, the electrons that participate in the uh, processes described in the Hubbard model are precisely one electron per site. So, imagine that is the situation that we are dealing with. So, the point is that if there is one electron at a given site, the uh, another electron can uh, hop on to that site only if it suffers a coulomb repulsion means that there is an increase in energy due to the coulomb repulsion. So, so the thing is that, uh, so if, if some site uh, is left vacant that implies therefore, that the some other site has two electrons in it. So, that is that is the implication of having precisely one electron per site. So, that is called half filling. So, half filling because uh, you see remember that an electron has up and down spin. So, a full filling would be having two electrons per site and that would be completely inert and uninteresting because if you have two electrons per site what happens is that the uh, electrons can uh, i mean can do nothing because they cannot hop because there are already two electrons per site you can't have three electrons per site so you cannot hop uh, but then uh, it can just put those two electrons have to be one up one down one up one down like that though they have to be in pairs and they can do nothing but just stay there. They cannot even flip uh, spins because uh, if they flip spins, then they will be violating Pauli principle. So, that is absolutely uninteresting. So, the uh, interesting situation is uh, the half filling, where you have one electron per site. 
So, where hopping is allowed, but at the cost of uh, coulomb repulsion, that means a mandatory cost of a coulomb repulsion, because if you have less than half filling, then you can hop around uh, and many times you would not be suffering any penalty in terms of. So, you can hop to an empty site and leave behind an empty site, that is not an option when you have half filling. So, you have to hop around only at the expense of uh, suffering a coulomb repulsion. So, uh, so that is the precise model that we are going to study. Okay. So, in this in this paragraph in this chapter I have pointed out that even before you study the uh, large repulsion limit of the Hubbard model which I am going to study in this section, but there are uh, very basic issues uh, related to the Hubbard model. One is uh, something called the metal insulator transition. So, the idea is that if, if uh, you have a um, Hubbard model and uh, if the coulomb repulsion becomes large enough in more than uh, in especially in three dimensions. So, you can show that uh, the system uh, goes from being a gapless system to a gapped system. So, that means it goes from being a metal to an insulator. So, so the question is uh, the one of the important goals in uh, the study of Hubbard model is finding this critical value of u at which the system becomes an insulator from a metal. So, uh, these are all very difficult questions and uh, I told you that in this course we will only be studying the models that are supposed to describe those type of phenomena, we would not be solving any of those models. It is just meant to uh, inform you that there are all these models that are worth solving and when understood properly will are likely to exhibit these types of behavior. Okay, so, coming back to this large u limit, so, so the idea is that uh, you see uh, if you have half filling, uh, if you have uh, a model with uh, exactly 1 electron per site and you have a large u limit, what that means is basically that the electrons will uh, see on the one hand they would like to hop, but if they hop they will be suffering a coulomb repulsion and if they suffer a coulomb repulsion uh, and if that coulomb repulsion is progressively made larger and larger. Uh, that becomes less and less attractive for the electrons to uh, hop around. So, that means that uh, given that there is a mandatory penalty of for hopping around namely the coulomb repulsion capital U and if you make that larger and larger there is a uh, it becomes less and less attractive for the electrons to hop. So, in the limit that U becomes very large so, the electrons would prefer to stay put. So, that means you have precisely one electron per site and they are refusing to hop around, but you might think that that is resembling the two electrons per site where they are anyway going to stay put then there is no choice even if u is small they can simply cannot hop, but here uh, u is large and uh, this also simply cannot hop. So, you might think these two are the same situations, but they are not because there is one thing the half filling electrons can do which the fully filled electrons cannot do, namely they can flip their spin. So, that means you see if you have one electron per site there is a spin degeneracy, the up spin is pretty much the same you know if you think about it that there is a uh, because there is no coulomb repulsion there is freedom for it to be up or down. So, there is no other electron sitting on top of it. So, therefore, what happens is that there is this system of electrons, they are all staying put at their uh, lattice uh, locations and uh, they are refusing to hop. So, therefore, they form an insulator. So, that means uh, there is no conduction process completely suppressed. So, it is an insulator, but however, the dynamics is through spin flips, there is the only dynamics that survives the electrons uh, flip spin. So, therefore, it uh, constitutes a magnetic insulator. So, it exhibits some some sort of magnetism, we have to see what sort of magnetism, but it certainly uh, exhibits some intrinsic form of magnetism and uh, it is an insulator. 
So, let us see what sort of magnetism this sort of uh, model exhibits. So, for that uh, I have to uh, perform a uh, somewhat technical transformation to uncover the precise uh, effective Hamiltonian that describes such a model. So, the Hubbard model itself is not very convenient to study the large u limit, because you see when u is very large all it says is that n i up times n i down should be 0. So, that means double occupancy is suppressed that is all it says, but then it does not say how the electron behaves in the presence or in the um, uh, when a double occupancy is strictly forbidden, how does the electron behave that is not clear. So, in fact, if you think about it uh, both the hopping is suppressed because it is half filling and double occupancy is suppressed because u is large. So, it seems like both the kinetic and potential energies are 0. I mean hopping it is after all what is Hubbard model it is hopping plus potential energy that capital U n i up n i down. So, if uh, hopping is suppressed the first one is 0, if n i up times n i down is uh, strictly 0 then the second one is 0. So, that does not make any sense. So, obviously, we, we have to perform a kind of a, a series expansion in inverse powers of u. So, that uh, only that will make sense. So, in order to do that uh, we have to uh, make certain observations to start with. First is that uh, if you have a Hamiltonian the uh, physics uh, of that system is equally well captured by another Hamiltonian which is uh, related to the original one through a unitary transformation. So, if you do not believe me here is uh, an uh, uh, explicit demonstration of that fact. So, suppose you want to calculate say uh, the average of some uh, uh, suppose you have an operator which uh, so we are working in the Heisenberg picture. So, that means the operators change with time. So, that means imagine you have an operator A which is a function of time and another operator B which is also a function of time. So, now imagine that uh, you want to find the average of uh, A as a function of time as a function of t times B as a function of t dash you want to find the average with respect to some state. Okay, so, how does that look like? So, obviously, it looks like this. So, that means, you first construct the uh, appropriate time evolved operators this way and then you find the average. So, now the claim is that you see these this uh, this particular average is also identical uh, it is mathematically the same as uh, doing the following. So, it is uh, the same as first uh, uh, you know unitarily transforming this Hamiltonian uh, via some operator which uh, depends on some continuous parameter called lambda and then similarly unitarily transforming uh, the these uh, um, you know initial uh, time values of these operators a and b also through the same unitary transformation and lastly you know evolve the uh, state that you are studying also uh, by this unitary transformation. So, if e raise to i uh, lambda g and g is the generator of the unitary transformation and this is the unitary operator which uh, uh, implements that transformation then clearly you can uh, it is just a mathematical identity for you to substitute uh, 9.55 and 9.56 into 9.54 and verify that 9.54 is exactly going to reduce to 9.53. Okay, so, that is uh, a trivial activity I am not going to do it. So, uh, that observation is important because you see it enables me to now construct uh, some unitarily transformed Hamiltonian uh, to study my physics rather than the original Hamiltonian. Notice that the original Hamiltonian uh, was uh, somewhat uh, clumsy in the sense that it had the hopping and it had a, a, a coulomb term which was uh, plus u times n i up times n i down and that u was um, a multiplicative uh, factor of uh, uh, n i up and n i down. So, if u is large uh, it is a and it is in the numerator it is not very convenient to do any kind of expansion with it. 
So, if u is large and it comes in the denominator, then it is convenient because you can expand in powers of 1 by u. So, that is the whole idea. So, I want to uh, write down a unitary transformation. So, that in some sense uh, that large u comes in the denominator rather than the numerator. Okay, so, how do I achieve all that? So, to do that I am going to first introduce uh, something called the projection operator. So, this projection operator is uh, just defined like this. So, basically uh, it says that it is the single occupancy projection operator. So, what it says is that it takes any any state and if you act it on this projection operator, it just uh, destroys all the doubly occupied uh, states. So, that means, uh, you see if you have a state, you can express that uh, in terms of uh, you know no occupancy plus single occupancy plus double occupancy, some kind of a linear combination like that. Now, if you take this operator and act it on that state, it destroys the part of that state which contains the double occupancy. And why is that? Because you see when uh, there is double occupancy n i up times n i down will be 1 and 1 minus 1 is 0. So, basically it really um, suppresses the double occupancy part of that state. So, similarly the, the exact opposite of that is uh, the, uh, the one which uh, weeds out the no mean which weeds out everything except the double occupancy. So, that means uh, if any uh, if any state has a uh, single occupancy it kind of uh, uh, this type of projection operator weeds that out it only uh, makes the double occupancy survive. So, this makes uh, the double occupancy survive this makes only single occupancy survive or it also makes no occupancy survive, but that that is not an option in the case we are considering because remember we are considering uh, half filling where uh, electrons are uh, there is one electron per site and they are all staying put at their locations. Okay, so, uh, bottom line is that uh, I can always, so this is a mathematical identity, so I can this is just one written in a funny way. So, uh, so what I am going to do is that uh, I am going to, uh, so if I expand this out, I will get four uh, pieces. One is uh, this H, which has been uh, sandwiched between uh, two uh, single occupancy projections and there is one which has been sandwiched between a single occupancy, double occupancy projection and lastly one which has been sandwiched between two double occupancy pro projections. So, uh, so what this does is you see H 2 2 is the one uh, that uh, contains this uh, the contribution due to u. See, because uh, see the other operators will actually destroy any uh, see um, these operators will all if you act it on any state the any double occupancy will immediately be destroyed by that. So, this will destroy double occupancy. So, if you want to find matrix elements between the states containing double occupancy, all these will be identically 0 except this one. Okay. So, this one will uh, have uh, the u dependent term. So, now the idea is that the uh, because only H 2 2 has the double occupancy u dependent term and u is very large. So, we are going to assume that H 2 2 therefore, is much larger than all the other 3. So, that means, H 2 2 is very large compared to H 1 1, H 1 H 2 1 and H 2 uh, H 1 2. So, now uh, think of this as a kind of a matrix. Uh, so, you will see that it has a there is a deeper reason for why you can do that. So, think of it like this. So, now you find the eigenvalues of. Uh, so, the claim is that the uh, you can write down a unitarily transformed uh, Hamiltonian from H. So, you start with H and you write down a unitary transformation. So, the claim is that the unitarily transformed Hamiltonian is going to have eigenvalues which correspond to the eigenvalues of this matrix. So, now if you work this out and this is approximately u. Okay. So, so if you work this out you will see that uh, basically, if when u is very large, the eigenvalues are precisely uh, these two. Uh, so, you can you can just work this out. So, you, you will see that uh, the Hamiltonian uh, 
uh, works out to be this and this. So, these will be the two Eigen values. So, now you see uh, if uh, I, I know this seems rather ad hoc. So, the more systematic way of doing this is to say that look I am going to first postulate that there is a uh, unitary operator called T of this sort. So, then uh, so if I use this T then I can basically weed out all the double occupancy uh, terms. Okay. So, I will end up with, uh, with a term which is uh, exceedingly small. So, th this one is anyway of the order of u, the next correction will be of the order of 1 by u. So, I will end up making an expansion in powers of 1 by u. Okay. So, uh, so, bottom line is that uh, yeah, so you will have to go through this, uh, these uh, calculations in detail. So, bottom line is that you see the H 1 1 is the, the hopping sandwiched between the two single occupancy projections and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you have this H 1 2 which is a sandwich between single and double occupancy and so on and so forth. So, now you can go ahead and evaluate these types of products that appear in the uh, in these expressions. Okay. So, that means say here for example. So, when you do that, so it is a it is a lot of tedious algebra. So, I will have to uh, request you to go through it because uh, firstly this proof is there in some review article and you would not be able to uh, you will probably able to follow it with as much ease or difficulty as this particular lecture because the rest of the details are just uh, a lot of tedious algebra. So, you just have to go through this algebra and then you will see that finally, you will be able to write down a Hamiltonian which uh, basically weeds out the. Uh, so, what is the, uh, beta s again? So, beta s basically make sure that if you have double occupancy it uh, fully kills it. That means, if n i up plus n i down n i up times n i down is 1 that means, if there are 2 electrons in a site that beta s is 0. So, it uh, makes sure that uh, all the states are uh, I mean basically it makes sure that all states are singly occupied. So, so therefore, the uh, effective Hamiltonian of a system when you have a, a single electron per site and you have uh, the coulomb repulsion between electrons is large the effective hamiltonian uh, involves uh, hopping with the single occupancy uh, means the hopping with the double occupancy fully suppressed because that's what beta s is so if uh, if there is a double occupancy beta s becomes 0. So, it does not allow double occupancy. So, so what is H t? H t is your original hopping. So, basically your effective Hamiltonian is uh, as if there is hopping, but then hopping subject to this constraint that you cannot have double occupancy on any site, but then there is an additional correction. So, that means that is that would be strictly true for infinite u. If u is actually infinite that will happen. So, that means, you have a situation where infinite u Hubbard model. So, infinite u Hubbard model is same as uh, just hopping with the double occupancy suppressed. So, that means, say you are not allowing double occupancy, but then uh, remember that if you are strictly looking at uh, uh, half field that means, one electron per site then uh, anyway uh, hopping is suppressed because of that, that reason. So, so therefore, uh, this will identically be 0 in case of half filling. Half filling when you have large u and half filling hopping is anyway forbidden. So, if hopping is forbidden you cannot say the Hamiltonian is 0. So, there will be a leading term which corresponds to a magnetic insulator. So, I told you right. So, if you have a hopping is suppressed all that electrons can do is uh, flip the spin sitting at their or original locations. So, that is exactly what this term is telling you. So, this term tells you that there is a uh, there is a mechanism there is a physical effect which is of the order of 1 by u where the electrons flip spin. So, that means, there is a spin spin interaction between nearest neighbors. So, the its nearest neighbor because remember the hopping. So, this somehow indirectly comes from hopping. 
So, it comes by diagonalize I mean diagonalizing that uh, unitary transformed matrix. So, basically there is a spin spin interaction that is induced by the fact uh, by a kind of a conspiracy between the fact that you have single electron per site and a large repulsion. So, this is an example of uh, a kind of magnetism and this is this is in particular it is basically anti ferromagnetism because u is positive and large t squared is positive. So, this is saying that energy is lowered if uh, the neighboring spins are anti parallel. So, that means one up one down one up one down so that sort of thing. So, uh, so this corresponds to a model of anti ferromagnetism. Okay. So, uh, so the point is that you see these lattice models uh, are likely to give you various models of magnetism if you uh, you know try to. Uh, so, the simplest uh, Hubbard model gives you anti ferromagnetism as a consequence of half filling and large u. So, um, similarly there will be other models will, which will give you other types of magnetism which we would not go into. So, uh, I will just uh, stop this section uh, with uh, with a uh, just pointing out that uh, there is an interesting important model called the condo model. So, the condo model uh, talks about a conduction electrons interacting with a localized uh, quantum spin. So, the way that is thought of it may be thought of as the limiting case of a model with hybridization. So, that means so, imagine you have a as usual a hopping situation. So, you have electrons which are itinerant they are hopping and there is a localized uh, electron at some origin which is localized and uh, you can have two such electrons sitting on that localized site and corresponding to this coulomb repulsion. But then uh, these electrons can hybridize with the uh, localized uh, electron. So, that means, you can have a electron from this itinerant uh, family of electrons uh, to uh, get transformed to this localized or the localized electrons can uh, dislodge from the localized site and become itinerant. So, bottom line is that you have this uh, hybridization term. So, just like in the earlier example where the Hubbard model could have been transformed to a model involving magnetic moments. So, here too I can transform this uh, you know hybridized uh, uh, model. So, it is called the Anderson uh, single impurity Anderson model. So, this uh, f can be transformed when u is very large uh, to something called the condo model. So, the condo model describes the uh, interaction of the it itinerant spin of the electron with the localized spin that is sitting there. Okay, so, this is an, a very important model in condensed matter, it has an important historical value also. So, so, similarly you can have a situation where you have a Anderson lattice model. So, that means you have a localized electrons sitting at various points in the lattice and then you have a, you know itinerant electrons hybridizing with them and the, the large u limit of that will give you something called the condo lattice model. Okay, so, that describes uh, the behavior of uh, conduction electrons interacting with uh, a lattice of spins. Okay, so, all these are important models in condensed matter physics and uh, I have just uh, succeeded in uh, maybe with some great effort uh, uh, it might require persuasion, but I have uh, somewhat succeeded in uh, pointing out to you that it is possible to transform one into the other. You can transform a model uh, which describes uh, you know itinerant electrons hybridizing with localized electrons into a model describing the interaction between the spins of the localized and the itinerant electrons. But uh, the downside to this is that both are equally intractable. So, all I have done is I have successfully mapped one uh, unsolvable intractable problem into another perhaps even more intractable problem. So, in some sense uh, it is not satisfying because uh, it does not uh, it sheds uh, some light in the sense that it uh, if there is some inkling or some uh, some indication about uh, where magnetism could come from some 
there is some indication that magnetism could come through these types of mechanisms in actual solids, but other than that there is absolutely no further information because I have not solved anything. I have just pointed out all these models are interesting, but unfortunately in this course that is the extent to which I can go. So, I will not be uh, solving any model of uh, any significance, I will simply be pointing out that such models are interesting and they are worth solving and that is for you to uh, explore the research literature and find out more about them. Okay, so, I am going to stop here and uh, in the next class, I will be discussing something slightly easier, which is basically uh, the idea of uh, a finite temperature Green's function. So, uh, so if the system is uh, in contact with some thermal reservoir how do you describe the Green's functions uh, that you remember I described the particle and whole Green's function. So, how does that, uh, how do those definitions change uh, when the system is in, in contact with a thermal reservoir exchanging energy and coming to an equilibrium with some temperature T. So, the canonical ensemble idea. So, that I will relegate to the next class. So, thank you for listening to me, but uh, this particular lecture would have been hard uh, for anyone uh, and uh, it is not easy to explain this in class. So, you really have to read that chapter very carefully line by line and perhaps even consult some relevant research uh, review articles and only then you will understand the Schrieffer Wolf transformation. Uh, so, but the rest uh, in the next lecture will be slightly easier. So, I hope you will join me for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.